If you program a language like Java, C++, Ruby or C Sharp, you may think you know all there is to know about object orientation. So think again. Unless you know this language, you really don't know object orientation. I'm Hugh and this is the first lesson in a series about understanding object orientation, proper object orientation, the way it was originally designed to be, and that may be very different from what you are used to. When I started programming in the early 1980s, most computers had, well, they had screens full of green or orange text. This, in fact, is one of the computers I used back then. It's a, a Compaq 3. It has a monochrome screen, a massive 640K of memory, a 20 megabyte hard disk, and a single five and a quarter inch floppy. Certainly nothing as fancy as a CD or a DVD drive, no USB ports or multimedia sound. Back in 1987, this was cutting edge hardware. In fact, I started programming years before this compact was released. My first computer in the early 80s was an Olivetti M24. The basic model came with just 128K of memory. Yes, 128 kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes, 128K. But I upgraded mine to a massive 512K of memory. It had one floppy disk drive and no hard disk. Now this was at a time when a 10 megabyte hard disk would set you back about 1000 pounds. So most people stuck with floppies. Back then we wrote our programs in very basic text editors. With some languages, for example some C compilers, programmers even had to write code using line editors. That is, they entered each line of code at the system prompt one by one and pressed enter to add that single line of code to their program. Now they couldn't just scroll up and down in a full screen text editor as we do today. I was lucky. My first programming language was Turbo Pascal, and it had a full screen editor, which you can see here. By modern standards, this was pretty simple, but by early 80s standards, it was cutting edge. At that time, I'd never even seen a user interface with overlapping windows, menus, and icons. The only mouse I knew about was one that squeaked and ate cheese. The modern world of computing with graphical user interfaces didn't yet exist. Well, not as far as the average computer user was concerned, at any rate. And yet, way back in the late 1970s, in a research unit of the company Xerox, called Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center, programmers were using an integrated development environment, just like the ones we use now. It had graphics, overlapping windows, drop-down and pop-up menus. They even had mice of this sort, which doesn't eat cheese. In the 1970s, the computers at Xerox Park were decades ahead of the rest of the world. Not only did they have mice and graphical interfaces, they were also using the first computer networks and object-oriented programming. By the mid to late 70s, Xerox Park had created the future of computing. At the heart of it was an integrated environment and programming language called Smalltalk. But the rest of the world simply didn't know about it. The first public release of Smalltalk in 1980 was called Smalltalk 80. The first I heard about it was in the August 1981 issue of the American computer magazine Byte, which you can see here. Now, this is a special issue all about small talk. And I still have my copy, which is, as you can see, is a bit worn now, but I still cherish it because this was the first hint I and most other programmers had that a revolution in computers was just about to happen. Now, to be honest, at the time, I could barely figure out half the things that were described in this issue of Byte. I didn't know what an object was or a class or a message. Byte even put the word mouse in inverted commas, and had to explain that it was a device that allows you to move an on-screen cursor and select certain options, which still didn't mean very much to me. Even the screenshots in the magazine baffled me. I assumed that they were diagrams of some sort, illustrations designed by an artist specifically for use in the magazine. 
I couldn't believe that programmers actually saw windows and font styles and graphics on their screens. In my experience, computers just didn't work like that. It wasn't until the late 1980s that graphical user interfaces became more commonplace in the world at large. The bizarre thing is that none of them were made by Xerox. Having invented much of what we now take for granted, Xerox pretty much ignored it all. The company was doing good business making photocopying machines, and the programmers at Xerox Park couldn't persuade the men in suits that there was a bigger business to be made in the computer revolution that was just about to begin. Not everyone was so short-sighted. In 1979, one of the founders of the Apple computer company, Steve Jobs, just 24 years old at that time, had the opportunity to take a look at what Xerox Park was doing. And his reaction? Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. So Xerox Park created a brilliant graphical user interface and gave it away. It was the Mac and later on Windows that went on to develop those ideas into what we all use today. I was a computer journalist in the early 1980s and so I was using several different graphical operating environments before most other PC users had even seen one. These included Epson's Taxi, Digital Research's Gem, and Microsoft Windows version 2. But the big breakthrough for PC users came in 1990 with the release of Windows 3 and in 1992 with Windows 3.1. This is the version of Smalltalk V that was released for Windows. Even in the early 90s, its user interface was actually in advance of Windows itself. In Smalltalk V, I have right-click mouse menus. In the rest of Windows, as in the file manager here, I don't. I suppose most programmers have heard of Smalltalk. Well, anyway, I hope they have. But not so many programmers have actually used Smalltalk. Which is a shame, because even if you don't want to write real-world programs in Smalltalk, just studying Smalltalk and understanding its big ideas will really, really help you write better object-oriented programs in other languages. And that's what this series is all about. It's not just about programming Smalltalk. There are already lots of good Smalltalk programming tutorials, and I've put a few links under this video. So what this series is about is understanding the fundamental ideas of object orientation. Once you understand those ideas in small talk, you should be able to apply them to other object oriented languages. As you do so, you might also notice that some of small talk's ideas have simply been forgotten. For example, what do you understand by encapsulation? Does it really just mean putting functions and data together? Or is there something more significant about it? Well, I think there is, but we'll come on to that later. And what about message passing? It's one of the core ideas of Smalltalk. But if you're a Java or a C-sharp programmer, you might never even have heard of message passing. Alan Kay, who was the principal designer of Smalltalk, the man, indeed, who coined the term object-oriented, once described object orientation this way. I thought of objects being like biological cells and or individual computers on a network, only able to communicate with messages. Oop, object-oriented programming to me means only messaging, local retention, 
and protection and hiding of state process and extreme late binding of all things. I'll be looking at messages in quite some depth later on in this series. The plain fact of the matter is that so-called object-oriented languages such as C-sharp, C++, Java and Object Pascal have taken ideas from Smalltalk and added them to languages derived ultimately from procedural languages in the tradition of, for example, C or Pascal. Some languages, such as Ruby and Python, have also mixed in Smalltalk-like ideas with elements inspired by other languages. But none of those languages is as purely and completely object-oriented as Smalltalk. So if you really want to understand object orientation, the best thing to do is to learn at least the basics of the language that started it all, and that is Smalltalk. To follow along with this series, I recommend that you download a free copy of Squeak Smalltalk, which is the modern Smalltalk implementation that I'll be using. You can download that from squeak.org. And also grab a free copy of this book, the Smalltalk V tutorial, which is available as a free PDF download. The links to that are under this video. Now this is a great tutorial, but don't take my word for that. This is what Alan Kay had to say about it. Smalltalk V I think is only $99 on the IBM PC and $150 on the Mac, <clears throat> so it's the cheapest Smalltalk. They have by far the best manual. None of the other manuals are even in second place because they actually don't believe that you understand about object-oriented programming in the beginning of the thing. They actually write the manual as a splendid tutorial, hands-on tutorial, for getting versed with all of the object-oriented lore and subclassing and building a, a very powerful little application. With that kind of recommendation, it makes sense to use this tutorial to learn small talk today. The only problem with this book is that it was written to accompany a version of Smalltalk that was released way back in the 1980s, and things have changed a bit since then. And while a modern Smalltalk like Squeak still works in broadly the same way as a 1980s Smalltalk like Smalltalk V, its environment and many of its classes and methods are different. And so a beginner would have a hard time using Squeak Smalltalk by following this tutorial. But I can help you get over those problems. In this series, I'll take you through the Smalltalk V tutorial and I'll explain how to translate it for use with Squeak. I'll guide you through every step so that you won't be bamboozled by any differences between the Smalltalk versions. In other words, read the book, that's the PDF version that you can download, but follow my examples. In the next lesson, I'll give you a quick introduction to Squeak. If you want to follow along, be sure to install a copy of Squeak and also download a copy of the Smalltalk V tutorial. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. And I hope I'll see you again soon.